Yeah. I, I, yeah. Hello and welcome to Phoenix Fan Fusion. Woo! Thank you all for coming today. Today we have an incredible panel for you. We are going to have a live podcast recording. We have four, correct? Four? Three. Three? <laughs> we are a single podcast. Yes. <laughs> we have three podcasts represented by four people. <laughs> And they're going to talk about the history of superhero cinema. All of us love the Marvel films, the MCU, but that's not where it all started. We're going to have the opportunity to take a look back at the history of where it came from and potentially where it might be going. Or maybe I'm putting words in their mouths. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get into the actual content today, I'd like to give them all an opportunity to introduce themselves. Starting with Chrissy. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Chrissy. Uh, uh, and with me is Nathan Blackwell. Hello, everyone. We're the most excellent 80s movies podcast, uh, where we watch the movies of the 80s that we love. Question mark? Question mark. <laughs> love, uh, exclamation point. Yes. <laughs> hate, <laughs> question mark, and <laughs> hate, exclamation point. Exclamation point. Uh, you know, with 2019 eyes to see whether, whether or not they're uh, as wonderful as we remember. Are they? <laughs> it's a mixed bag. You'll have to listen to the podcast to find out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that book. Yes. Often surprised by uh, what I truly love now, like as an adult, and when I'm like, ew, why was I obsessed with this movie? <laughs> yeah. Duly noted. <laughs> All right. Uh, Nathan Blackwell, also the most excellent 80s movie podcast. Um, I'm a filmmaker, and so that's p also part of one of the takes oh, is right. that we've, I she's mentioned. a comedian, I'm a filmmaker, so we're yeah. lending different perspectives, but. Yes, his perspective is one of knowledge, and mine is one of stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> you may take twice as long because I'm one of Because <laughs> I'm just one person. Hi, everybody. I'm Andy Nelson from The Next Reel. Uh, the Next Reel is a film podcast, and we have a, uh, another podcast called The Marvel Movie Minute, and that is why I'm here, because... We talk about the Marvel uh, Cinematic Universe one minute at a time. A uh, lot of minutes to discuss on our show. And yes, it is as awesome as it sounds. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it is very detailed and very nerdy, and we love it. Imagine <laughs> one minute from the Iron Man movie that you just love and talk about it. Yeah. Yes. And sometimes yes. it's a minute of hammering. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know. <laughs> right. Who knew you would have such a, a such a key yeah. moment I, in the franchise I to did discuss? Love that yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kr Chrissy and I were guests on that, and we we did how many five episodes? Five, five episodes. And we yeah. never got out of the cave. Nope. <laughs> nope. Yep. You were in the cave the whole time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. I'm Kyle Olson. I'm from the Road to Infinity podcast. It's a Marvel movies podcast. We decided to watch a Marvel movie a week in anticipation of Infinity War. And then when we found out Infinity War was actually part one of two, we sort of kept going, and now we keep talking about all the Marvel stuff. Uh, what I like to do is give a little bit of perspective in terms of uh, where the comics were, what the original uh, um, characters came from, and what the difference is in storyline, plus uh, a little bit of background of where Hollywood was and what was going on at the time that the movies came out to give you a little bit of context, and then we get super nerdy about uh, all the Marvel movies. So we're going to be... Uh, we are sort of waiting for Spider-Man. <laughs> That's our big thing. But then after that, we're going to try and uh, come out with some more regular stuff uh, in between because it's going to be 10 months before the next Marvel movie after that. So we're going to do some stuff in between to, to keep Marvel fans happy. Marvel's taking a break? <laughs> <laughs> right. I have learned so much about the history of Marvel movies that I had no idea about by <laughs> listening to that podcast. Yeah. Good stuff. So subscribe to all of these podcasts because they are awesome and these are awesome people you want to listen to on a regular basis. We'll wait. Including <laughs> for the next hour. Yes. yes. As we talk about the secret origins of superhero cinema. So today, our podcasters have taken a look at history of superhero cinema and broken it into three distinct eras. They have then each chosen a movie that they feel is representative or important from that area that they'd like to actually talk about in greater detail for a couple minutes. And they've also identified some that perhaps are maybe not worth an entire uh, a couple minutes, but are something that we could spend a little bit of time briefly mentioning in passing as representative or important to the history and the narrative of superhero cinema. So with that, we are going to jump right in. You believe man can fly. <laughs> Superman the movie, 1978. 
They're first. <laughs> yeah, fr mm. so most I feel like so most excellent pre eighties. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Super eighties yeah. and post eighties today. We're yeah. going all over the place. That's right. Superman was really the the bar to kind of get over, like mm -hmm. uh, in terms of all. I felt like all the superhero movies. I felt like Superman, and then like not until like Spider Man, that or, or I guess Batman counts. Batman, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's yeah, yeah, all hold on there. Yeah, so there was just a few because, so, yeah, a lot of people for a long time said there was like a superhero movie curse. Like, yeah, a, co a good superhero movie couldn't be done because of the ridiculousness of the costume. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I felt like Superman was the the one in my mind that was a great movie mm -hmm. and also a great superhero movie. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's so good. when you rewatched it. What did what like stood out to you as still being great? Well, so so Richard Donner, I feel like he's got a good handle on making. I mean, the, you know, the, again, it's 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 very dated. The effects, you know, are are not up to what we expect. But I, he, he focuses on the people. Yeah. You know, on the humans and what they want. I feel like this is the most charismatic Superman we've ever seen. Oh yeah. Yeah, Christopher Reeve is so great. Yeah. He's just so cute and great and like pure. Yeah, I, I mean, him. I feel like you could you could cut out like 15 minutes of the movie, like all the visual effects. At least, well, yeah. no, like if you cut out all the visual effects from the movie where mm -hmm. he's being Superman, like it would still be a good movie. Oh, okay. I okay. Yeah. I get what you're As saying. in like there's still, you the know, the human element is still compelling. Yeah. What, what struck me when I rewatched this, and I was obsessed with these movies as a kid, not just this one, but all of the ones that came after, mm -hmm. no matter how bad they got, <laughs> the <laughs> they worse got they bad. got, the mm -hmm. more I liked them. I think Superman 3 is possibly my favorite. <laughs> you fed oh. off of it <laughs> I like can't wait Nuclear to Man. I, revisit I, that one oh, on your show. Yeah. I <laughs> love it so much. The sound effect of the tankards of ooze in Superman 3 that heat up, ooh. <laughs> like it's in my mind, and it's just I love it so much. The robot but, like, lady scared me so much as a kid. Oh um, yes. Yes. Oh my god. And gosh. bad Superman. Uh huh. Yeah. I had feelings about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but so, th and that was what struck me about rewatching this was like how horny everybody is. <laughs> <laughs> in 1978 that's, Superman. Yeah. Like that's the 70s. She asked him what color her underpants are, and like. <laughs> Some of the dialogue that definitely went over my head as a kid, watching mm -hmm. watching as a, a, an adult, I was like, oh my god, calm down, Lois <laughs> Lane. Like, yeah, we uh, really don't get any 70s superhero movies. Like, yeah. as soon as no. superhero movies start, we're into the 80s and yep. into, you know, I feel like the 80s are a better match of what, like, superhero mm -hmm. movies are. But the, this is the closest we get to, like, a 70s superhero movie. Yeah. I mean, he was on television for a long time. Uh, you know that was the Superman was just a TV guy for yeah. the, for the most part. Never, nobody thought he could make this big of a leap. Well, it was well, it is Superman who can leap over just a tall building. Leap over single yeah. bound. Yeah. Yeah. If we're, but if, if we're talking about evolution, like look how jacked <laughs> you're expected to be now yeah, as a superhero. So it's, a, it's a slide of uh, Henry Cavill's Superman next to Christopher Reeve's Superman, and like Christopher Reeve refused to wear any like padding in his suit. Um, and like I mean, obviously Henry Cavill has to be yeah. has some padding somewhere. Uh, <laughs> but like we've all seen Henry Cavill, like that man is jacked. Like who knew that you could have that many abs? Yeah, it's and beyond a six pack. And of course Christopher <laughs> Reeves looks like a normal person, yeah. but again, like I'll never look that good. It's I mean, still no, he looks great. Like, he looks like very he strong. still looks like a physically fit person, but now like the expectation is that they look like they've been attacked by like a swarm of bees and they're swollen <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in terms of the comics, I don't get too far off of it because you know, we're, we're sticking to movies, but there was a, a big debate after sort of Superman came out is that, is it Clark Kent pretending to be Superman or is he always Superman pretending to be Clark Kent? Mm -hmm. So at this point, he's Clark Kent. He's a human, he's, nor he's a guy, and he can also do this stuff. Mm -hmm. By the time we get to where we have Man of Steel, it's the opposite. Yeah. He's an yeah, alien, right, right. and they emphasize mm -hmm. the alienness of him, and that he's putting on a suit, like to pretending to be a human being. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very different feeling in the movie because there's a lot of heart in Superman seventy eight, and that there yeah. really isn't in Ye Man of Steel. Yeah, yeah. It, go, go well, ahead. And, and also I think that uh, you know a big thing about it is they that they made Superman for 
everybody. It wasn't yeah. just a yeah. kids yeah. a kids movie. And the TV shows, like I mean, I think superhero stories really were largely relegated to you know kids and comics, and they weren't thought of as something for the whole family. And so I think that's something that they really did with. 1978 Superman is they said it's it's a story for everybody yeah. and it's yeah. a really interesting story mm -hmm. and it's about real estate yeah <laughs> it's about Actually. real estate I mean, but yeah, and they made him look like normal yeah. a power suit it's yeah. like Luthor <laughs> trying to get yeah. land you know right. and like you're talking yeah. about the adult content too like that's it's really a, a pretty adult story in terms of that even mm -hmm. though you still see Superman saving people and lifting a helicopter right 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 which is an interesting transition to the, the next movie that we have on the list here, <laughs> uh, Flash Gordon, which is very much <laughs> not an everyman kind of story, much more of a sci-fi, and we have Road to Infinity War. Yes, about. that's me. So, all right, to talk about Flash Gordon, we have to go back in time a little bit to talk about Dino De Laurentiis. Now, Dino De Laurentiis was an Italian producer who got super powerful in Hollywood. Uh, at this point, he had produced Barbarella and Serpico and Death Wish. He was like... Uh, box office Midas at this point. So he could kind of do what he wanted. So uh, in 19, I think about 1974, I couldn't find the exact date, he had a meeting with a young filmmaker who had made a movie. And the guy was super excited about making a Flash Gordon movie, had all these great ideas. And the other end of said, you've made one teen comedy. Why should I ever listen to you? And just sent him on his way. So that guy took his ideas, revamped them a little bit, and created Star Wars. <laughs> so, uh, Dino De Laurentiis was stinging from this, so that he had a chance, because if you watch any of the Flash Gordon serials and you watch Star Wars, you can see there is a very clear line of, like, the adventure and, like, what's next and what's next, like, the serialization of it. So, he wanted his own Star Wars. So, I know this is about superhero cinema, but Star Wars casts a long uh, shadow over all of this stuff, because everyone was chasing Star Wars. Everyone wanted to have that thing that, that kids and adults and everyone loved. Uh, so he wanted to make Flash Gordon his Star Wars. So he put together this uh, this thing. And now Flash Gordon was not really that well known of a property. So it's not like Superman, where like you can go to Indonesia and there's kids running around in Superman outfits. Like Flash Gordon was at this point was a comic strip. That's what everyone knew it as. Uh, so to, it was sort of like not the the thing you would think would would reach everyone. And and it didn't. Uh, <laughs> so I've never seen it. The, yeah. the, the story behind the scenes of this was is just is just we could do a whole hour just about all the the machinations that happened behind the scenes. But like the uh, some of the highlights I found were um, they they got a real smart script and the other just went no I, I want it I want it ridiculous I want it comic booky so he hired a guy who worked on Batman sixty six like the the Adam oh, West yay. Batman and that's what he wanted mm -hmm. and that's the guy then because you know has barely spoken English that had to be translated by someone into Italian. And then once it was approved, it had to be translated back into English, <laughs> which explains a lot when you watch the movie because <laughs> almost nothing wow. makes sense. Um, they, uh, so when they, they shot it in mostly in Italy with an Italian crew who none of them spoke English, so the director could talk to the cast and the cast director and no one could talk to the crew at all. They had to have translators for everything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, through it all, the thing that amazed me most watching it again, especially in high definition, is the costumes are amazing. Yay. Like they went all out. Like I, was, I, was, I had to pause on like, you know, my, my HD screen. Yeah, that's a humble brag. <laughs> and because, like, because you see, like, uh, Ming's uh, like collar and his his chest plate are all covered uh, and they're all shiny. And I realized there's they're made up of thousands of beads. Like, ev they they stitch together every single one of these things. There's no like it, you in the the picture we're showing on there. It's very much like a spandex looking thing. But inside every little piece is all hand stitched. There must have been a, a hundred Italian sewers out there just frantically working on all these costumes. Um, it's terrible. Like, I mean, it's like, you watch it again, and it, it's, it makes no sense at all, mostly because this is like the personification of, of white privilege. Like, mm. uh, their Flash Gordon is such a lunk. He is like, he is, there's nothing to it. He has no charisma, no charm, no military ability. Like, they, he shows up, and they're all like, you need to lead a revolution. Why? Like he has, like he's, he's, not even, he's not yeah. smarter, he's not faster, he's not smarter, he's just the blonde haired, blue eyed white guy that showed up. <laughs> and so they're like, uh -huh. well, you're clearly you're the guy. Yeah, <laughs> at, le at least like in the serial, he was like a pilot yes. and he was like and a, a mi yeah, like a military hero yeah. and then he had a scientist friend and a, like a reporter girlfriend and they were like a team, yeah. you know, and they yeah. knew what they were doing. And then we have like a football player yeah, who seems not, like he's and lost. not even a great one. Like he's not supposed to be Joe Montana. Like he's <laughs> like I mean he's like he's like third string. I mean like 
there's, there's he, really gets, he gets to fly it. in his own plane. He's he like a private well, jet. Sure, yeah, sure. Well, he's still in the NFL, so he still gets perks. So yeah, he's not, he's not um, you know, like a, a kicker. Um, but, <laughs> but it's, uh, but it's, sports it's, ball reference. Yeah, I, that's a, I just, come to me for the sports ball references. I there's our sports day. reference <laughs> for the day. Yeah, no, no, I have, I have no idea what I'm talking about. I say third string just because I've heard someone say it. Uh, but you can see a lot of where it came from. Like, did anyone take any inspiration from this? Not really. Uh, but you can see the the level of, of, of craftsmanship in terms of like they built real sets. Like, mm -hmm. as opposed to now, like you watch episode one and it's like you, it's them walking on green screens and you can tell the difference between them mm -hmm. them running down a hallway in, in Flash Gordon where they built a real hallway and they built a you know a, a giant disc for them to fight on top of that apparently was so newly finished that when the actors fall, fell on it, they had to stop production to what, get the silver paint off of them because <laughs> it was still wet. Uh, oh but the, the, the production design, um, you can see, like, I, I was looking at some of the characters, and they look like characters that come, come out of Canto Bite, Blight? Is it Blight? Canto, Canto Bite. Bite, yeah. Canto Bite uh, from uh, Last Jedi, or uh, the Sovereign from Guardians of the Galaxy 2. It's that mm -hmm. same sort of completely ridiculous, over-the-top, overly-dressed, rich, mm -hmm. you know, a-holes uh, uh, surrounding them all. It's, 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 it's clear that uh, they had, the people had watched it, too. But, boy, yeah, it's, it was such a lot. I mean, like, John Carter, which doesn't get a lot of love, mm -hmm did this story <laughs> so much better. <laughs> and yeah, this is one because it's got two great queen songs and it, it sort of endures, but mm -hmm. yeah. It so, so would you say that um, maybe like a theme of these early uh, superhero movies is that they're still kind of grasping on how to adapt a comic book? Yeah, I would definitely say. I mean, that they, they found with Superman, they, they sort of went for, crashing Christopher Reeve, I think, was the mm -hmm. best thing they ever did because mm -hmm. he has so much natural charisma and, he's, and you just like him. Like nobody likes Flash. Like, <laughs> no. yeah, and, yeah, get I mean, out of here, mm -hmm. Flash. I, and I, I, I know yeah. it's the Sam Jones who who was, who was first they, admitted it was not his finest performance yeah. ever, but they picked him from the. Oh, this is another piece of trivia that I forgot about. So they couldn't find anybody to be Flash. They went to Kurt Russell. Kurt Russell looked, read the script, and went, <laughs> "Yeah, no." <laughs> 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 Kurt Russell, he's like, he went off to do the thing. So I think he made a better career choice. Yeah. They went to uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger auditioned for it, and no one could understand what he was saying. So like, no. So they got Sam Jones off of the dating game. He was a contestant. <laughs> they were watching it on TV. They're wow. like, "That's my guy." That's as close to my offensive Italian. That was that your Dino? Yeah. That's, that's my Dino. My guy. Yeah, that's the. Uh, so I, th I think it came down to a lot of it was casting. So mm -hmm. it's like if you if they had had Christopher Reeve playing Flash Gordon, mm -hmm. it might have been a very different movie. Yeah, but it it's sounds like the, it sounds like the important thing with this one was the uh, the, the costume. Mm -hmm. And so True. moving on because we oh yeah, get yeah. to yeah. a bunch of more films. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk for a moment briefly about Swamp Thing, and then uh, <laughs> we can move on to uh, Supergirl. You know, I just think Swamp Thing, um, I think it fits in exactly with what we were just saying in that they were still trying to figure out how to adapt these comic books, mm -hmm. these properties. I mean, they had Wes Craven directing it and they tried to go a little bit with his horror route and everything, but it really, I, I don't know, it, it, it's an interesting film to revisit. I, I rewatched it for this, and uh, it, uh, but it, it really is lacking. Yeah. It's not a great film, and it's not, I mean, I think if they had... Uh, I'm not as familiar with uh, Swamp Thing, other than I think a couple um, a couple uh, issues of it. But it's I feel like if they let Wes Craven really go the horror route, they could have done something interesting with it. But I think that it just fails on that part of the way. I think there's Is a Swamp place Thing for it. Not like a like a monster in the like Frankenstein Wolfman. At this point, pretty much. Yes. Like okay. this is before Alice. Well, this well right about the time Alan Moore took yeah. over the comic and he made him into like a. a plant elemental and so he became really spiritual and stuff and, and super popular. And Ellen he found yeah. Jesus. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, more like he became Jesus. But um, the I, I think that there is a place for a low budget superhero movie though. I kind of wish mm -hmm. that every superhero movie wasn't a hundred million dollars. Like this yeah. was this was a low budget nothing kind of thing. I think for not necessarily for Swamp Thing, but some of these characters, you can make a dirty ten million dollar movie and have it be great. I wish they would sort of do that now. Mm -hmm. So how did we get from Swamp Thing to uh, Supergirl <laughs> and uh, things like Howard the Duck? <laughs> oh, Howard. Oh, Howard. Because <laughs> we have those briefly mentioned as, yeah. uh, well, we're going to spend a little bit of time with Howard If we Duck. just trusted George yeah. Lucas and let him do whatever he wants. Oh, yeah, yeah, this right. was at the height of, like, whatever George wanted, George got, and that's what he wanted. <laughs> yeah, Howard the Duck was, I mean, well, and this is an interesting one because it actually had been around for quite a while. I mean, George Lucas, you know, found the comic shortly after he did American Graffiti and he talked to Willard Hike and uh, Gloria Katz who he who wrote that with him and and he's like oh this would be a fun little thing to make and 
over the next uh, you know, 10 years or so, they, they kind of came up with a plan and, and they made this kind of mess of a movie. And <laughs> what's interesting is that they actually initially wanted to do it animated. And I think if maybe they had and if maybe they had stuck with kind of the character a little closer, it would have been better. But they had a deal with Universal and Universal required it to be a live action movie that they made. And George Lucas was like, oh, I've got this special effects company. We'll do this duck and it'll be great. And they spent a lot of time trying to get this duck right, and they never did. And it just was this disastrous thing, and nobody ever bought into this duck. It's just a terrible costume from beginning to end, and it's a terrible script. <laughs> and the problem is, I mean, and interestingly, I thought this movie was actually a bomb. It actually barely made its money back <laughs> in the box office, which uh, was a little bit of a surprise. But um, they... Um, the writers, they, they didn't even, and I think this goes to kind of what we were saying, this whole idea of trying to uh, figure out what, how they're going to translate a, a, a comic book property into a film. A hike in Katz's first inclination with it was to kind of remove like all the kind of rude and obnoxious stuff that kind of makes Howard the Duck who he is. Mm -hmm. And also they, their version of it, uh, this is what Gloria Katz said. She said, it's a film about a duck from outer space. It's not supposed to be an existential experience. We're supposed to have fun with this concept, but for some reason, reviewers weren't able to get over that problem. <laughs> Blaming it on everyone else. Um, Gerber, uh, Steve Gerber is the one who came up with the character. And he said, his view of the, the character is that it's, it's a kind of this, this uh, cosmic, he calls it, this is no joke. There it is, the cosmic giggle, the funniest gag in the universe. That life's most serious moments and most incredibly dumb moments are often distinguishable only by a momentary point of view. Anyone who doesn't believe this probably cannot enjoy reading the Howard the Duck. His, his point of view on kind of the absurdity of it all is kind of what makes Howard the Duck what Howard the Duck is. And I don't think Hike and Katz ever figured that out. And that, I think, is the biggest problem with it. Plus that awful costume. Yeah. So. And you're talking about adult content in Superman. The adult content in this is so creepy. Oh, my oh God. God. <laughs> it's like, you know, no. the, the, yeah. the 80s, what they could get away with in PG <laughs> movies sometimes. You know, let's, let's make this, let's paint this lady white and make her look like a duck and put her in a bathtub. And we can have a nude scene now. It's <laughs> like, yeah. what? Nope. <laughs> oh, yeah. Terrible movie. Yeah. That's why we're all so well adjusted now as uh. adults. <laughs> Not to mention the uh, the animal love that we get with uh, right? Leah Thompson <laughs> and, and yeah. Howard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Marvel's first uh, <laughs> film, and uh, yeah, a bit of a disaster right out of the but gate. But you know, memorable theme song. So. <laughs> oh. I was tempted to bring it. In the, right? yeah, I, know. I, I couldn't it find it on iTunes. Oh, so yeah. like, well. But but you wouldn't want to. Uh, no, I could probably find it on YouTube. But yeah, again, <laughs> I wouldn't want to. No. No. So. How does that compare to some of like the darker themes you see in uh, the 1989 Punisher, or even Batman? Which yeah, you know, yeah. Well, yeah. Numbers. Punisher is, is interesting because it's it's the first one that's really true to the character. I mean, like they were afraid of they were afraid of the well they were afraid of the costume, <laughs> so it wasn't like you know he so he never wears the skull in the whole thing. But you know, Dolph Lundgren I thought did a pretty decent job as being like. But it basically, they made Death Wish again. Well, well, it's like, yeah, if the Punisher doesn't have a costume, then he's just like a really angry dude. Right. Like, yeah. With a guy, with well, an angry white guy with a gun. I know. That always goes well. Oh, more and of those stories, yeah, please. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and that was another dark one. But then they also were like, oh, but it, it's a comic book, so we still have to have kids. And then they, they had the whole, like, rescue the kids story. And the, the, like, what is this happening? Because he has to be a hero. <laughs> Meanwhile, the kids are like, leave us out of this. We yeah, don't. We, like, we don't want to be in your I think terrible it, it, it movie, was PG-13, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. it's like yeah, saving these kids, and then the God, oh, I don't it's know. It's yeah. groping for an audience. Like they, yeah. there's not a built-in comic book movie audience yet, and so they're taking like properties that were cheap but like adult themed, and trying yeah. to then it's like, oh, it's a comic book. We'll give it to kids. Well, or they're making like things really dumb. Yeah. Well, and I think the the Punisher is an example where they they really took Dolph Lundgren as the property mm. and yeah, said, here's an action star. Mm -hmm. Let's find a comic book that we can kind of inject into his type of movie, and that's really all they did with that one. Yeah. Unlike Batman, uh, yeah. which came out uh, same year, yeah. and this is one where it had been kind of a the the story had always been kind of dark, but because of kind of the, the really campy uh, TV show from the 60s and some of the, the campier comic book storylines and everything, it had kind of gotten lost, and Batman was a bit of a joke. And it took uh, the producers, Michael Uslan and Benjamin Melnicker, to, they actually 
bought the rights to it in 1979, and then it took them 10 years to actually get somebody interested in making a darker comic story. I think people were still going, oh, but we want it to be like Superman. We want it to be bright. It's for the kids and everything. And they finally got people to bite into this thing with this, this darker presence of this, this dark character. And I think getting Tim Burton at the helm of it and Michael Keaton, as yes. much as it was a controversial at the time, um, you know, Batmania was crazy in 1989, but people were still arguing that Michael Keaton was a terrible choice. You know, he's this comedian. He's this guy he's who just played Beetlejuice. Yeah. Exactly. Nobody wanted to see him in the movie. But then you release it. And, I mean, this movie um, became the number one uh, uh, box office opener for its opening weekend. It was the fastest film to earn $100 million in just 11 days. Oh, yeah. Ah, the good old days. I still remember it being oh, yeah. a phenomenon. Yeah, like it, it, it was just, it was huge. It, it was, was. Yeah. and it was like Batman summer. Like yes. every oh, big yeah. oh yeah, we all had the whole summer. We got the cups from McDonald's. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it was it was a media blitz. It I mean, was. So still good. have my movie stub from it. <laughs> wow. Aww. that's so sweet. It is framed on his wall. <laughs> but it's like Tim Burton and Michael Keaton both have that like dark playfulness, right? Mm -hmm. Where they can yeah. do something that's really like creepy and so dark in its like meaning and origins, but it's still playful and like joyful and in its oddity amusing. Mm. Like they, uh, so I think they were a great team. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, obviously they had worked together before with Beetlejuice, so they already had that chemistry. Mm -hmm. And then they brought it again to uh, Batman Returns, regardless of what you think of it, they mm -hmm. still were, they still had their, their partnership mm -hmm. and their chemistry yeah. and everything. Yeah. And, and so it was a good team. What I think is funny, this is just a side note, um, in the process of trying to get this film made, uh, Uslan and Melnicker actually had a lot of different directors and people attached. And at one point, they were talking to Ivan Reitman to direct it, who wanted Bill Murray to be Batman and Eddie Murphy to play Robin. Oh, my so, God. Yeah. That got pretty far, again, too. <laughs> yeah, falling back into the campy territory. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That would have been a yeah. Oh, I can't even imagine what that like would look like. Like the most casual Batman and the most like <laughs> high energy Robin. <laughs> yeah, this really, I mean, Batman obviously has been around since, you know, 75 years or more at this point. Uh, but he had been he had been a joke before. Now to bring him in serious, now he is sort of like a a thumbprint on the media landscape. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like it's always the the question is always who is Batman now? I mean, like we're as we're recording this, we're between Batman, there's there's oh. sort of a mm -hmm. new Batman that they say is coming. Robert Pattinson. Yeah, Robert Pattinson. Yeah. That's right. So, but that's that's news. Like, when is that movie coming out? Nobody knows. But we're already talking yeah, about who the next Batman. Yeah, people right. are already starting their own new letter writing campaign <laughs> to <laughs> oust him. <laughs> exactly. Yes, they're already stirring it up and hasn't even been officially announced. Uh, Some but things never change. To rewatch this, it's clear that Tim Burton is not a comic book fan, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because and he's even said he's he's on a record saying, I've never read a comic book story in my life. I don't do a Tim Burton impression, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, it, Batman in the movie is a straight up murderer. Like, yeah. <laughs> there's that whole question of, like, does Batman kill? Well, he has this machine guns on his often. car, <laughs> and he drives into a building and drops a bomb. So, yeah, he straight up murders dudes in this. And, like, you know, a 10 year old me watching going, like, oh, it's just Batman. This is great. But now you That's watch right. it with these mm -hmm. eyes and go, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, he's like the Punisher. He's, yep. he's killing really? people. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But they were really bad people. They were bad people, <laughs> yeah. so it's okay. When they're in, a, when they're in a, you know, thug costumes, it's yeah. okay. Exactly. But exactly. even though it diverged from the source in mm -hmm. quite a number of ways, it definitely, because of its success, had a, a huge impact over, you know, the, the next era of oh. comic book films. Yeah, absolutely. The, the everything else that came after it is, as you all put it, in the shadow of the past. Yeah, yeah so right. before they were just kind of groping for cheap properties, it's like Superman was big, but... There weren't a lot of replicators, but once Batman came out and became massive, then everyone was trying to make their Batman. Now, yeah. finally, there was now an audience for these comic book movies. And they looked for that as the template because yeah. things are about to get dark, <laughs> cinematically. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> like, there's a... Uh, Literally yeah, like, and figuratively. That's right, because <laughs> Ninja Turtles. Is <laughs> yeah. Ninja Turtles. And it's, one of the well, that's right. And the most of the scenes Ninja take Ninja place <laughs> at night in the dark, <laughs> just like mm -hmm. in Batman. Literally dark, but The sun but yes. never shines in Gotham. But it was a Jim, uh, a Jim Henson one. And, uh, you know, this is one where I think they were trying to figure out how dark do we go with mm -hmm. these comic yeah. book movies? Because they, they kind of, the comics arguably were a little darker. Yeah, I was a fan of, really the, of yes. them, and oh, yeah. there really was light. a lot of blood. It was definitely lethal, yeah. for sure. <laughs> right. 
a very different change. Because that was thing. reflection off of the Daredevil comics, which were the popular time. They were sort of a reflection of that, mm -hmm. and then they they sort of then they became you know radical dudes. So then how did we get it. from that to a movie like uh, The Rocketeer in 91? Okay, The Rocketeer is on my thing because it's one of my favorite movies of all time. And it, it, it is so does not belong anywhere <laughs> where exactly where it is. So I, it's, it's a, it, I, I think it's a terrific movie that like, completely um, uh, gets misunderstood a lot. So now this, this is my gimmick. So to, to talk about The Rocketeer 1991, when you talk about Disney and, and coming out of the 80s and 90s, we're – they were ice cold. Like we think of Disney now as the predominant media company. Everything they own Star Wars. They, they are the hottest thing. Whatever they put out, even if it's terrible, they're going to make it. That, like Dumbo, which I have not seen. So I'm, uh, Dumbo comes out, gets lukewarm reception. Still makes a hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, it's it's there. They're such a cultural juggernaut. But that was not the case in the late '80s and the '90s. They could not find a hit to save their lives. They were struggling. Uh, live action. Live action, oh, especially live action, yeah. So, uh, uh, Little, well, Little Mermaid had just come out. So their, their animation studio had been shut down. Uh, they came out with Little Mermaid, it took a long shot, and it became huge, and suddenly they could make animated movies again. And so that was the thing. But this was the time that they were animating themselves, and so it was every two or usually three years before another one coming out. So Beauty and the Beast was still on the horizon. Like it wasn't even, like they were just barely talking about it. So they had Little Mermaid, and then their, if you look through their slate of live action movies from like 75 to, to 91, you'll be shocked because you've never heard of any of those movies. I mean, they, Disney has buried them because they were huge disasters. They were, but they were consistently putting out two live action movies a year and nobody was going to them. Uh, so, and, and this is also the time that as Euro Disney was sucking all the money out of their pockets too. So they finally got a hit and it was called Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. And it was, not only was it a legitimately great movie, but it was a success for them, and they had no idea what to do. Like, they, we've never had a live action <laughs> success in so long. We'd, and so they, they were trying to figure out how to capitalize on it. They've, and, and they still really didn't. They, they tried to sequelize and everything else, and it's been awful. But well, we got a remake coming out soon. And a remake is coming, yeah. Um, I think for the Disney Plus, I think that's where it's going. Uh, that's where, we'll see. Um, so they went, all right, so that guy who directed that movie clearly knows what he's doing, so let's let him do what he wants to do. And what he wanted to do was an adaptation of one of his favorite comic books, and that was The Rocketeer. And so they, they sort of went, okay, do you think that'll do it? So he made a brilliant 1930s action movie right up there with 1999's The Mummy and uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. It fits right into that thing. And audiences did not want that at all. <laughs> like, not from Disney especially. They wanted dark. That's right. Because this that, That's the thing. Is, this is the right movie at the wrong mm -hmm. time. Coming in the shadow of the bat, coming after Ninja Turtles. Like, <laughs> this, was, this did not find its audience. It was a huge bomb, which is a, a it's heartbreaking because it's such a brilliant, funny, sweet movie, and the effects still hold up. I mean, like we're talking about the the, the some of the effects in Superman are laughably bad at this point, even you know. But the, the flying stuff still works, and mm -hmm. even in Rocketeer, the flying stuff still works. You can see how they did a lot of it. I but believed a man could fly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and and still they can you know ten. Uh, Ten plus years later, I still mm -hmm. believe he can fly. Uh, you should you mount a campaign to bring this movie back. I really think it is. Status. If they drop this now, I think it would be huge. Mm -hmm. yep. But what interesting? So, so these things all you know, so come back around. So this movie is a disaster. It gets buried. It gets put away. Disney it disacknowledges its existence, and then. The Marvel Cinematic Universe shows up, and they suddenly have they like, oh yeah, Captain America stories, and thing. we need like a World War II action thing, and they call up the director, Joe Johnson. They call up the director of The Rocketeer and said, hey, you know how to do this, and he does, and he makes Captain America: The First Avenger, and it's brilliant, and everybody loves it. And I was like, this is the same thing, <laughs> like he did it again. Like, like if you like this, go watch The Rocketeer. You're gonna love it. No I wonder if it would have done Rocketeer. well if it had been released 10 years earlier in the Superman era I think before so. the darkness mm -hmm. kind yeah. of took over. I mean, over. even though the effects probably would have been a lot cruder, I think that oh, it's that because yeah. this is he, it's it's so it's bright and it's sunny and he's uh, he's a reluctant he's a terrible at his job. I mean, like he's a, as a hero, he does not know what he's doing. He makes uh, mistakes all the way along, which coming off of Batman, which is what everyone is, he is so self-assured and never, mm -hmm. never questions up and, and always knows what he's doing. Rocketeer, like there, the picture we have up here is him flying along. That picture is when he salutes a kid that he's flying next to and shuts off his rocket pack and yep. plummets to earth and barely gets it turned back on again and saves himself. Oops, <laughs> like it happens all through the mm -hmm. movie. He makes these rookie mistakes because he doesn't know what he's doing. So he's not, 
Right? He's not Indiana Jones. He's not Bruce Wayne. Uh, he's just a guy trying to figure this stuff out, and it's what makes it great. He's like it. Iron Man, uh, Tony trying to figure out the Mark II. Yeah, yeah. For yeah. The it's whole a, movie. In, the, in the minutes that I mm -hmm. watched with you, for the, that's exactly what it is. Like that period of time, him figuring it out. That's the whole movie. And I, I just love it. And it seems pretty uh, different from the, the darkness of, of the Batman. Which is what the audience wanted. <laughs> which is what the audience wanted and what some of the rest of, of the 90s brought us. It was this mix of weird and wacky and, and bright and dark and even some animated films including Batman Mask of the Phantasm. Yeah, that, out of the success of Batman, then comes Batman the Animated Series, then they decide to make a movie of that. Uh, which is another huge flop. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and once again, and it, and it so does not deserve it. Master Phantasm is a brilliant animated movie, and it's such a great piece of the, animate, the Batman the animated series. Uh, and it just did not find an audience. And now it, I think it's it's beloved. But at the time, I mean, like, uh, did, you, did you go see it when it was out? And no, not until yeah, video. See, yeah. Yeah. It, it, and it I was a kid went, who loved Batman. Right. So. It came and went so fast. Well, yeah. I, and I think Batman by this point. I think they missed their, their mark because it was the live action Batman was cool. And yes. now it was animated, all of a sudden it was like, oh, that's for kids now, I'm not gonna watch it because I'm already old enough to watch the stuff where it's live action. Yeah. It sounds like the studios really couldn't figure out what they were really looking for. I mean, then you have things like The Mask, and then you have things like The Crow, which are two very different movies um, that yeah. have very different audiences and very different feel uh, and, and styles to them. And released in the same year. Yeah, so we, we've got like indie comics now, like, you know, like Vertigo and like mm -hmm. these darker adult comics like The Crow, yeah. which um, I just rewatched this morning. Uh, it, this was one of those movies that I was obsessed with, like when yeah. you're a teenager. Oh my God. Oh this yeah. is a, so Poster much like teenage uh -huh. angst just running through this movie. Oh yes, yeah. I was 13 when this movie came out and I was, I was all about it. Oh yeah. yes. Like it's dark, it's mysterious, you've got creepy black makeup, like the story of the movie itself is tragic. There's the cure on the soundtrack. Yeah, like yeah if you want to like revisit your youth, this is like <laughs> a good movie for that mm -hmm. of that angsty time. But that also kind of like a, it kind of there's not just one type of comic book movie, you know. Like comics, it's like a diverse medium, and there's not just Superman. There's like this kind of stuff, and I feel like this, even though it wasn't like a huge hit, and it was you know obviously the tragedy of of um, Jason Lee, Brandon, Brandon Lee. Brandon. Brandon. Brandon, yeah. Brand Brandon's dead too. <laughs> no, Brandon Lee, um, Brandon Lee's death, um, which kind of adds to the angst and the sorrow to the whole experience. Well, it does because like everybody knew that story before yeah. the movie came out, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. So I had no idea that this was based on a comic book or, or what any of the source material was. It was just like a s slightly gothic, dark, mm -hmm. creepy movie with you know, that gave me an excuse to wear black vinyl and, right. and a, a lot of <laughs> eyeliner, uh, you know. But yeah, I could see like the bad version of this would be someone saying it's a comic book and comic book movies should be like this. Mm -hmm. yes. Whereas like there's, again, so many different uh, types of stories yeah. in comics and that I you really have to kind of create and mold it around that specific Because he's like a punisher. That's yeah. what he is. Like he's a punisher from beyond the grave. Um, but as like as dated as I feared this movie would be, and as dated as it truly is, like <laughs> it's still it's so, so 90s. watchable. Oh yes, but yeah. it's so watchable. It is such and a it's slice of the '90s. Like it's it everything about it is is exactly right for what it exactly is. Exactly right. And the mm -hmm. casting, like we talked about earlier, like yes. the casting of Brandon Lee is like he has that perfect like sensitivity beyond the dark exterior. Which yeah. if you're 13, mm -hmm. you're like, yeah, that's what I need. I need some sensitivity. Yeah. On the mm -hmm. inside, you can, you but some creepy darkness and long, right? greasy you, you hair on the outside. You know that he's hurt inside, uh -huh. you know, yeah. and, and still manifests. I can all save out. him. Can you imagine like Keanu Reeves doing this? I mean, I I'm sure can, it was offered and to I him. will, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> I can. Calm, down, Chris, right? calm down, Chris. Calm down. Can we get a letter writing campaign <laughs> for this coming right. out? But I think a lot, like we were talking about, though, it really comes down to the lead. Yeah. I mean, that, especially mm -hmm. for these, like what we have, almost everything we have is a singular hero. Yeah. There's been, they, they, at this point, they were not talking about teams or any of that stuff, and it comes down to that guy, and Brandon Lee was the guy. Mm -hmm. Like, he was perfect in that role. The and lead and the adaptation, like the people who actually translate it, I think, are mm -hmm. understand the meat of what they're trying to do with mm -hmm. the story. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, and then, then the, you know, like a, a 90s kid unattended in fishnets and combat boots skating <laughs> around on the rainy streets of <laughs> the city is like, yeah, I'm like, I want to be her. Yeah. I want to be best friends with the crow and just <laughs> skate around and have Ernie Hudson buy me Chinese food. But I think it shows it, too, because it's, it's a strong concept of, like, the revenge stuff, too, and they have never been able to, to replicate it. They've oh tried. No, the crow, too, is terrible. Oh, God, it's awful. And it was a TV series. Briefly. And it was a TV series, yeah. and it was, they've, they've made three or four different mm -hmm. directed video movies. Too. I think David Boreanaz is in one, is in one of them. What? Yes. He's a, he's a villain, I think. He's, isn't he the bad, he's not the crow. He's the... I don't remember. But yeah, but well, they're, they are out. terrible. When you get to uh, most awful 90s podcast, when mm -hmm. you guys do the next one, then yeah. <laughs> That's up the whole next, thing yeah. The crow. But yeah, but, but it shows the, the power of it. Like having, it's, it's that, that, that magical thing of like uh, Stephen Norrington and, and, and Ernie Hudson too, which who, had yeah. who, had, who after Brandon couldn't finish his scenes, had, had a, his part got a lot bigger. And so he had to carry a lot of the movie too. Yeah. They're all fantastic in that movie. Mm -hmm. It just comes together in a really weird way. And Biling yeah. is insane. <laughs> it sounds like there's a there's a mix of the, the talent of the people who are involved, but also understanding the source material Absolutely. and understanding the audience. And it sounds like sometimes they got it, mm -hmm. and the yeah. studios understood what they were doing, and sometimes mm -hmm. they didn't. <laughs> I, I forgot oh. this guy. Oh. This yes. Oh yeah. my yeah. gosh. Yeah. Alec Baldwin as the, the shadow. <laughs> and I this think is he even acknowledges Dennis that was a mistake. Oh, jeez. Oh, oh, I could, I could uh, talk for so the rest of the podcast, but I'm, I'm so glad Dredd, we have going a, to. a much <laughs> better <laughs> version of that. Oh, yes, there we go. Girl. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, so Tank good. Girl. Oh, I love Tank Girl so much. So uh, instead of like talking about the... Um, uh, the, the sort of where we're at in terms of the studio and behind the scenes stuff. Um, let's talk about women for once because Yay. like since Supergirl came out and was a terrible movie, then Hollywood said, well, then clearly women can't be heroes. And so then, and they have, and so for the rest of this time, you haven't, you've not seen one woman up on it's the proven. screen. Uh, so this one, they, they finally, had, they had, they found this really weird independent comic. Like, once again, no Marvel, no DC. This is all on its own, Tank Girl. Uh, and then do it. And so this is a movie directed by a woman. This is the, her, the production designer was a woman, a uh, female lead. Uh, like it is, it is girl power before girl power. I think we're actually right about and the time. Yeah, I say 95. That's, that's and all the time. dudes are kangaroos. And all the Take dudes that. are kangaroos. Yes, this is a movie <laughs> where Lori Petty has sex with a mutant kangaroo. Yeah. Like how did this, how is this not a gigantic hit? I don't understand. Ice-T <laughs> is in this movie as a mutant kangaroo. Yep. Like, it's like even even so, people have tried to come after him about that. Like saying that he's like he's like man, I got paid so much for that movie. He's like he's like I'm not ashamed of it at all. Like he is proud of the work he did. Malcolm McDowell was right after Star Trek Generations as he as cast him as the villain. It was it was unbelievable. So uh, Rachel Talley is the one who uh, directed it. She uh, had worked for John Waters. So if you watch John Waters movies and then you watch this, you can kind of see. Oh yeah, clearly it's the same aesthetic. Um, she's gone on to direct episodes of Doctor Who. Uh, Heaven Sent and Hellbent, she directed Twice Upon a Time. Uh, the director tonight was Catherine Hardwick, who uh, has directed Lords of Dogtown in 13. Mm -hmm. uh, Lori Petty uh, is, is amazing. She, she was coming off of League of Their Own and Free Willy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've actually met, so, I, so how much do I love this movie? I have one poster at my house. One movie poster hanging up, and it is Tank Girl. <laughs> and it is signed by Lori Petty. No wow. way! It is my pride and joy. Um, what no Naomi Watts is also in this movie as her first performance. She uh, unfortunately does not like to talk about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but so, but the coming into this, there it, 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 I know it comes out now and it's it's sort of seen as this weird offbeat thing. But going into it, everybody was really really excited about what it could be. So much so that they went to Stan Winston to create the Rippers, the mutant kangaroos. And Stan Winston was white hot at this time. He was doing Jurassic Park. He did Terminator. He did Predator. All these designs. And he said, I want to make the mutant kangaroos for this. And they're like, we're a tiny little movie that's going to shoot in Australia. Like, we have no money. And he said, all right, I'll do it for half. And so he, like, basically slashed. He had no reason to, but he wanted to do it so badly. He slashed his budget, made the costumes for it, and they are still on display in his museum. He asked oh. for them to be put right next to the Predator and the Alien. Like, he was so proud of it. Um, it's... It's terrible in term because mostly because um, the studio wanted a very traditional story and Tank Girl is not a traditional mm -hmm. story at all. I don't know how they looked at the script of mutant kangaroos and you know uh, and like there's even one the deleted scene with a, a, a room of dildos and they like went no ours has to go and they tried <laughs> to, and they tried they took it from the director and tried to cut it into a linear direct storyline 
and, and also slash the budget at the same time, and it just, it, it really does not hold it together. But you can see the spirit still living on in it. It has such a great heart, and it's funny, and it's weird, and it's exciting. Uh, they took all the stuff they couldn't do and embraced it. There was the, a major action sequence going to happen with, like, there's tanks and there's jets all flying around doing all of these things. Uh, and they, the, the studio said, yeah, we're not going to pay for any of that. So they went to an animation studio, and they had the animation studio create the entire sequence. So the movie's going along, and all of a sudden it just switches, and it's this brilliant graffiti pop art animation battle scene that happens. And then they, like, at the end, they just all, they all walk out of it like, yeah, that's, that's what just that's happened. What happened. <laughs> it's so awesome. And, and so I, I called it the awesome apocalypse because this is, like, post-apocalyptic, but everyone thinks everything is cool and everything is awesome. And you can see that stuff in like Sunset Overdrive and Rage 2 and Far Cry New Dawn where instead of having it, everything be brown and gray like Mad Max, yeah. you have this explosion of like anything that's color, everybody wants it because that's the only color you get to see is what you find. Yeah. And, and I like something that you said there. It's this idea of it being the heart and soul and having this, yeah. you can feel yes. that that movie had something special. They didn't pull it off right, yeah. but it had something mm -hmm. special. Which yeah. actually takes us kind of to the next era that we're talking about, era number three, I Make This Look Good, <laughs> where we take the excitement of the, the 90s and the things they tried to do, mm. and we turn it into something that's actually good. We don't get to talk about the, the mm. Phantom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Oh, no, so skip the Phantom. On. Wow. And so, I didn't know this mm. started out with no, no, but this is this, but this is this is still the grim and gritty. This is the this yeah. is the, this is the right. crow influence. This is the yeah. dark, serious yep. breeding. Yeah. yeah, because they can't make bright spandex look good yet. No, no. <laughs> yeah, we're still we're still in the the black leather phase, and we yeah. will be for for probably the next you know the mm -hmm. next number of years. Yeah, probably until X Men. Yeah, X Men are still in the yeah. black leather. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like yep. they don't even do like a full costume for for a it's while. It's like the yellow that. X, right? And that's yeah, it. yeah, right. right. Yeah. Subtle, subtle, you mm -hmm. know. But we go from Spawn to, to movies like Steel. Oy. Oh, Steel. Oh, dear. Yes. So Steel, I, I just, just as a side thing of Steel, I know. Let's not talk right. about <laughs> Steel. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, not, not going to spend a lot of time on it. But I just, I love the fact that they, they decided to make a spinoff of Superman, which is what Steel is. Steel was a character in the comics that was, in, was a guy who was inspired John Henry Irons, for those of you who are paying attention. Um, he, uh, he was so inspired by Superman, he made a super suit and became Steel. So they decided to make a steel movie starring Shaq, which, you know, sure, box office gold, because <laughs> Kazam, um, and strip it of all connection to Superman. Like, they, if he's just a guy who puts on a suit, and there's no mention of Superman at all. He's just like, he's basically an Iron Man before Iron Man, I guess? Yeah. And it's awful. <laughs> <laughs> and we go from that to something like Men in Black. Yeah, I feel like I'm dominating now, because this mm -hmm. is mine as well. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll, I'll make it brief. Yeah, I have to, this, is, this is tough because it's hard. So Men in Black is, yeah, well, the, the, it's, it's easy to be brief on it because it's just a perfect movie. It's like so good. there's, it, uh -huh. I love Men in Black so much, and just I watched it again, even with a critical eye, and it's just brilliant. Like everything, th this is this is the weird um, a uh, alchemy of of Hollywood. Everyone coming into this movie are at their peak. Mm -hmm. Like you have, uh, like Tommy Lee Jones is right off of, of The Fugitive, mm -hmm. and Will Smith is right off of Independence Day, and Barry Sonnenfeld is right off of the Addams Family movies, uh, and you get, uh, uh, like you have Ed Solomon, who had created uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, you have Bo Welch, who had just worked with Danny Elfman on all of his stuff, uh, uh, sorry, Barry Welch and Danny Elfman, who had just worked with Tim Burton on all of his stuff, like, and Rick Baker, who is like a, a, a special effects legend, all of them are at the peak of their talents, and they all come together. This and, it, and Steven Spielberg shepherds the whole thing. Yep. Oh my God! It's, so it's, it's, it, this is the Avengers of movies. Like these are, and, and everybody is coming in at the absolute peak, and they, and instead of it completely imploding, it creates a fantastic movie. Now behind the scenes, apparently it was a mess. Like they were running around everywhere, and they, the scripts changed dramatically, and and they reshot. They they actually re end up almost re-shooting the movie in editing. They, they eliminated an entire alien race. They, they changed dialogue. Uh, they, they did all the stuff. Negative. But it still works. Like, all of it works. Everybody is, is funny and interesting. It, the world is believable. There is real heart and real emotions. And I, I'll just do one of my favorite scenes in this as a writer uh, is there's a, that, that, it, that lit up my brain is that there's a scene where... Um, 
they're at the farmhouse where you hear an argument going on between uh, the husband and his wife, uh, just about how terrible everything is. And it's, it's all done in one shot, and you see uh, a light starting in the sky come down, and it turns out to be an alien ship. And so he's complaining about everything that's going on and saying, like, the only thing that works around here is my truck, as the alien ship smashes into his truck and destroys it. And he steps out. Now, anyone who is a writer, they, at that point, would, the, the typical thing would be, oh, my kid, like, oh, no, why would it? Like this huge reaction. But instead, he walks out, opens the door, looks at the destroyed truck and goes, figures. <laughs> it's just like this, oh, my God. Like, like, I remember in the theater, just like it lighting up my brain, like, oh, we're not, we're going a whole different direction. Like, you never know where this movie is going to go because it, it has a completely different rhythm to anything else. And it sounds like they finally got to a point where they actually they elevated the source material. They understood it's better than their the comic. audience mm -hmm. and are willing, as a studio, to meet the audience where they are. Because at the same time we have something like that, we also have movies like Blade. Which yep. is first great Marvel yeah. action. Dark yeah, and right. Gritty and completely different. Yeah, it's and its and own it's thing. It's its own movie. And it's honoring okay. its source material. Yeah. And then comedy movies like Mystery Men. Yeah, a, a team. <laughs> we finally have a team. Oh, my God. <laughs> I loved this movie when it came out in 1999. Like, I was all about Ben Stiller, Hank Azaria, oh, Janine Garofalo. Eddie Izzard is in this movie. Uh, Greg Kinnear, like William H. Macy. The Blue Raja. Paul Rubens. Just like on paper, it looks so good. And I watch this movie, and it's garbage. <laughs> <laughs> it's straight trash. Oh, There's nothing wow. good about this oh, movie. Wow. <laughs> but nothing Casanova survived. Frankenstein. It is so bad. Like, it's so <laughs> sexist and, like, casually <laughs> racist. And the jokes wow. are so homophobic. And wow. it's, it's so bad. <laughs> And then, but then just a year later, we've got X-Men, yeah. which I feel like, in my mind, is the movie that kind of broke the, I, you know, we're talking about like comic book movies and superhero movies, but I feel like X-Men was the first one to kind of dispel the curse of the superhero movie. Yeah. Well, yeah, and it and really was... Like, Mystery Man's supposed to be a spoof of superhero movies that don't even actually exist yet. <laughs> That's right, yeah. That was a, it's like, the, it's spoofing the, the Avengers time. before there is an Avengers. Yeah. It's spoofing the X-Men before there is an X-Men. Yeah, it made sense as a comic because there were plenty of right. comics with teams. Movie but by this point, nobody had seen a team mm -hmm. in a comic that really was a successful film. And so you're, you're getting this kind of comedy spoof of these team you know, superheroes, but nobody was like, nobody really connected that with anything. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, then X-Men comes out, and I mean, it really does kind of uh, change the face of things, because now you've got a team, they're building this whole team, it's about these these mutants coming together and, and creating these uh, these teams and, and, and battling, and it, it, it's something that really kind of, uh, they did right, Brian Singer, yep. Yeah, they're wearing their superpowers like on their sleeves. Yeah, like, exactly. Everyone was like overtly superhero. Yeah. Exactly. That's their one thing that they do, and they do it well. And uh, plus, it had a message, and I think that's something that Brian Singer obviously gravitated to. But also, I think that is something that helps X Men resonate, and I think it helped uh, resonate with audiences too. That whole idea of, of you know, you know, people being prejudiced because you ha you're, there's something different about you, but there, it doesn't mean that you are different. And the way that that message played out in the film. I think it made it a very strong film. It was huge at the box office, and that really is something that kind of uh, grew this film to be a huge thing and allowed for us to kind of get to the place where we are now, where you have things like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you have the, the DC Universe, all these different universes that people are creating because people you know, took a couple decades to figure it all out. And, and we even have some unique um, uh, universes, things like Unbreakable, which didn't mm -hmm. necessarily know it was going to be a universe, or we didn't know it was going to be no. a universe when it first came out. That, that was uh, a stealth comic Nor was movie. it based on anything. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't, it was, they, it was they, almost like the first meta yeah. kind of look yeah, at nobody, comics. Yeah, like he did not tell anybody. Like when nobody knew going in what it was, uh, that it was going to be a comic book movie. And, and as you've already mentioned, we do have things like X-Men that came out around the same period of time. It's kind of funny to think about all these movies that came out right around yeah. the same period of time. And like the year after the Matrix. I mean, like <laughs> so is there anything more you wanted to say about X-Men? Because we do have a couple minutes here for life. Uh, you know, I, I mean, it was just another, uh, like Batman, like Superman, this was another huge hit at the box office. And I think it speaks to the fact that this is what people were ready for. They were ready for this transition. And I mean, it was a huge opening weekend. It was the highest grossing opening weekend for a superhero film beating Batman Forever. Um, sixth biggest opening of all time. I and mean, it was just a big film. And obviously it allowed Brian Singer 
um, another persona non grata these days, yeah. <laughs> to uh, continue making more of these and to tell more of these stories before uh, and know, the other power people of X Men too is casting. Like, Yo, like yeah. I mean, like the, most of the people going into this were. I mean, we had Patrick Stewart, who we loved, but no one knew who Ian McKellen was. This well, was before Lord of the Rings. And the big, the big surprise with that one was Hugh Jackman yes. coming in as yeah, Wolverine exactly. because but it originally was Doug Ray Scott yeah. who was supposed to oh, be Wolverine, Doug but he. Um, he had to back out because he got injured on the set of uh, Mission, Mission Impossible, Impossible 2, 2, and so he couldn't do it. From and mo then motorcycles. They were already, <laughs> yeah, jump, right, John motorcycle Woo. stunts. They were Versus already Woo. in production on X-Men, and they were kind of panicking, and Brian Singer wanted Russell Crowe to be in it, and he didn't think that he was the right choice, but he said, hey, I've got this buddy down under, uh, Hugh Jackman, uh, why don't you give him a try? And Hugh Jackman, uh, he didn't have as much experience, but he read for the part, and he was perfect. And He's perfect. now, like, what? I can't yeah. even imagine them doing this movie without yeah. him. And yeah. I think he, I mean, I, I mean, you mentioned casting. Yeah. That, I think, is another thing that makes all of these, like the ones that succeed, they find the right people to be a part of it and yes. make the team. I mean, even in universes mm -hmm. like Harry Potter, it's because they cast it right yeah. Yeah. that you really end up being yeah. able to create that yeah. universe. X-Men and X2 are like star-making machines. Like, Absolutely. everybody in that, that group has gone on to do amazing stuff, and are s almost all are still working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And then Absolutely. even with like the the X Men origin stuff, like w that cast mm -hmm. has just exploded. Jennifer Lawrence, yeah. you know, oh, just yeah. a small part in that, yeah. and now they have to base every movie around her. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jayla. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah you can, and you can see from X Men, then we we have the the building blocks that mm -hmm. they will use to make the MCU. Yeah. Yeah. And all the stuff that comes after. Which is the precursor to all the things that we know and love. So. Uh, I, I believe that takes us to the end today, so thank you all for your time today, and uh, uh, thank you all for hanging out with us for an hour. We loved having you today. Real quick, one last thing, if you like what we're talking about, if you like hearing these people, they do have podcasts, they run on a regular basis, we've got the Marvel Movie Minute, taking on the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe one minute at a time, now playing Iron Man. Yeah, that's right. We're uh, cranking through the Marvel movies, and next up we'll be talking about the Incredible Hulk one minute at a time. We also have the most excellent 80s movies, or most excellent 80s movies podcast. It's the podcast where filmmaker Nathan Blackwell of Skid Studios and a comedian, Chrissy Lentz of National Comedy Theater, take up hilarious books and 80s movies we love, hate, hate to love and love to hate, with 2018 eyes and probably a significant haze of nostalgia. <laughs> well said. And Road to Infinity. In January of 2018, the members of Legible Skull came up with a mad plan, watch a Marvel movie a week leading up to Infinity War, and put out a podcast about each one. And we did it. But little did we know, the story wouldn't be completed until Endgame. Or after. Yeah. So thank you to uh, Phoenix Fan Fusion for letting us do our panel together. That was very cool of them. This was a lot of fun. So, and thank you guys for coming out and doing this. I like this crossover. It was a blast. Yeah, this was Yay. fun. I, was like, I, could, I could keep going. I could talk for an hour about this stuff. Specifically <laughs> about Tank Girl. I yeah, right. could talk, talk a lot about Tank Girl. I, I, I could talk about the room <laughs> long before that. So we'll do the, the, our post show will be talking about Judge Dredd because I have a lot of feelings about that. Oh, dear. <laughs> Great. So well Thanks, everyone. Panel, Thanks. Just Judge Dredd. Yeah. 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 Tank Girl. It'll be first half Judge Dredd, then yep. half Tank Girl. Yeah, you go. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for listening. All right. Thanks, guys.